Pi is the symbol mathematicians use for a number that the ancient Greeks quite cleverly managed to figure out. This number is sometimes expressed as 3 and 1 seventh. Other times it is expressed as 22 sevenths, fractionally. Other times it is expressed as 3.14, and they've taken it out literally with computers thousands of places. I don't even know ultimately what, it might be an infinite number. Pi. There's pi, and there's pi. Now, if you are talking about baking, and you say pi, Everybody knows what you mean. You mean the pizza pie. But if you were talking about geometry, everybody knows what you mean. You are talking about 3.14 pie. Easy as pie. Where it gets complicated is this. We have a pizza pie. Pie. <coughs> and we cut it to serve eight people. Geometrical patterns in diameter. So you have a pizza pie <laughs> now cut into eight triangles. But suppose You wanted to figure out not the taste of the pizza pie, not what kind of mozzarella you used in the recipe for the pizza pie, not what brand of olive oil you put on the pizza pie, not what kind of toppings you want on the pizza pie. Suppose you wanted to figure out the area of the pizza pie. How does one figure out the area of a pie? Well, you use pie. As we've known at least since the time of Archimedes, or whoever, or Euclid, The area of a circle equals pi times the square of the radius. The area of a circle equals pi r square. So, if you want to know the area of a pie, you must first know pie. <laughs> it's easy as pie. The radius is one half of the diameter. From there to there, that's the radius and you square it, and then you multiply it by 3.14, and that will tell you 
the area of your pizza pie. The pie will tell you about the pie. How big is the pie? Just a moment, I'll get a pie. I need a pie to figure out how big the pie is so I can answer your question, how big is the pie? What do you mean you need a pie to tell me how big the pie is? Do you have another pie of the same size that you just compare it to? No. I mean pie pie. What pie? You know, pie. It becomes the mathematical version of Abbott and Costello's Who's On First. Pie or pie? Half the diameter is the radius. You square the radius and you multiply it by pi. And once you multiply it by pi, you will know what is the pi. <laughs> Easy as pi. You got a problem here. The mathematics is straightforward. It's very simple. This is the most basic level of geometry. They teach it to little kids. The mathematics is very simple. What's complicated is the terminology. Numbers can be easier to deal with than words. Now in Judaism, the two get mixed with something called gematria. And then occult, occultism in Judaism, Jewish mysticism, gets, gets, gets into the occult with it with something called Kabbalah. So you have pi and you have pi. It's no problem talking about pi in the context of a bakery. Lemon meringue, coconut custard, or apple. And it's no problem talking about pi in a math class. It's simply 3.14 that you use to calculate the area of a pi, of a circle. But when the circle happens to be a pi, now you have pi and pi. This can be confusing to a little kid. Now, if I explain it to you and you're a rational person, you're not confused. But you would think that a mathematician would be even less confused. You'd think that a math teacher would be even less confused. What happens when the expert gets more confused? He gets nuts. <laughs> right now, in the United States, there is a quote unquote, for want of a better description, ecumenical rapprochement between Mormons and evangelical Christians with somebody called Dr. Dr. Ravi Zacharias at the forefront. Dr. Ravi Zacharias is joined by Dr. Professor Craig Hazan from Talbot Seminary and by Dr. Richard Moo from Fuller Cemetery. <laughs> doctor, doctor, doctor. Professor, professor, professor. What kind of a professor of mathematics does not know the difference between 3.14 and coconut custard? There is no professor of mathematics anywhere in the world that does not understand the difference between 3.14 and coconut custard. However, we have theologians. Theologians who do not understand the difference between pi and pi. They are preaching in Mormon tabernacles, saying that evangelicals have 
borne false witness against Mormons. Richard Mew actually said that, and Ravi Zacharias and Craig Hazen went along with him saying it. They didn't even speak up. If you read the Book of Mormon, the Mormons say that the Jesus Christ of the Church of Latter-day Saints is the half-brother of Satan. They say Jesus Christ, the Jesus Christ of the Book of Mormons, is the half-brother of Satan. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is monogenes in Greek, the only begotten of the Father. Amen. So you've got two different people saying that they are Jesus Christ. Does that make coconut custard equal 3.14? The Mormon Jesus is not the Jesus of the New Testament. They're completely different. Now if you were talking about Mormonism in isolation from the Gospel, you'd have no problem defining their Jesus as this other Jesus. And if you were talking about the Gospel in isolation from the Book of Mormon, you'd have no problem talking about the real Jesus of the Gospel as distinct from the Mormon one. But when you put them both together in the same discussion, you better make sure if you're talking about coconut custard or 3.14. 22 sevenths does not equal tomato sauce, mozzarella, dough, and olive oil. Pie is not pie. And pie is not pie. <laughs> You've got to distinguish. Which pie do you mean? You've got to distinguish which Jesus do you mean? But we have people who are professors not drawing that distinction? This is the devil's geometry. One, one of the generic names or words for God in the Arabic language, one of them is Eil. Arabic has a lot of words and many dialects. Another is Allah. Now, Hebrew and Arabic and Persian and Akkadian, Chaldean, and all that are all Semitic languages. They have a similar ancient root. They have similarities in vocabulary, in grammar, and in syntax. Also differences. But they come from the same family. Much the same as Norwegian and Swedish come from the same family. Or German and Dutch come from the same family. Or Italian and Portuguese come from the same family. So while Allah is a word for God, as a generic term, Allah was also the name of a ancient Arabian moon god. That's why you have the crescent on top of the mosque on the minaret. But Allah is also the equivalent of the Hebrew Elohim. Only in the Old Testament, Elohim was not 
called Elohim as a personal name. He was called Yahweh. Yahweh is not the moon god. Yes, if you were to translate Elohim into Arabic, you could translate it Allah. You could translate it Allah. And if you were to translate Allah into Hebrew, you could translate it Elohim. Well, you would. But Yahweh is not the moon god. But the Jesus Christ of the gospel is not the half-brother of Satan of the Mormons. Coconut custard is not 3.14. This is not a new problem. I've explained many times it is an old problem. In the Old Testament, you have Baal. Baal is the Hebrew word For husband, master, owner. Prophets like Hosea said to Israel, Yahweh is your Baal. Much the same as Yeshua would be the bridegroom of the church. Bridegroom Hatan, husband Baal. in Hebrew. But the Canaanites also had a Baal. And they called him Baal HaShemaim. Literally, the husband or the master of heaven. Notice the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Sounds the same. If I was just to say pie, that's all, just pie, would you know if I meant pizza or if I meant 3.14? You'd have no way of knowing because it sounds the same. And so in ancient Israel, they were worshiping Baal. Baal. Remember what Jesus said? Many will come in my name. <laughs> that does not only mean that they're claiming he sent them. It means they're claiming to be him. <laughs> the American false prophet, Jerry Falwell, a Baptist preacher, as he calls himself, called an antichrist an unsung hero. If you read the book, and I wouldn't recommend it, but there's a book called The Divine Principle written by the Korean mind control cult leader, Sun Young Moon, a convicted felon, a convicted criminal. And I know people say that out of the Unification Church, his cult will tell you it's a mind control cult based on money. He claims to be the Lord of the Second Advent. In other words, the return of Christ. He says Jesus Christ failed in his first coming. His mission did not succeed, so he came to succeed where Christ failed. And when he was on trial in America for a felony for which he was convicted, he said under oath, Jesus Christ appeared to him. And the prosecutor asked him, how did you know it was Jesus Christ? And he said, I recognized him from his pictures. <laughs> He said that under oath. It's a matter of public record. Yet a Baptist preacher calls this man a hero. This man says his wife is the Holy Spirit. Oh. 
Many will come in my name. Wow. Allah. Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Pi or Pi. I have explained many times the phenomena of Gnosticism, where people have a subjective mystical revelation, which they claim, called the Gnosos. It's not important what the Bible says, it's important what they say about it. And if you don't see it, you don't have the revelation yet. <laughs> Even though what they're saying may be utterly contradictory to what the Bible actually states. Copenhagen people are great examples. But today, the biggest Gnostics around are New Ages. And it's always the same. I told you, I go to Hawaii and I witness to these guys in Maui. You say, you saw the light. You thinking Jesus, the true light that comes into the world in John chapter 1. They're going to tell you that they saw the light. The cosmic illumination of the inner self. You're going to tell them you were born again? They're going to tell you they were born again. Reincarnation. You were going to tell them you believe in sin? They believe in sin. That's giving place to negative energy. You're going to tell them you believe in the Holy Spirit? They believe in the Holy Spirit. The zeitgeist. The spirit of the age. No matter what you say to them, they will say they believe the same thing. Only their light is not your light. Their Holy Spirit is not your Holy Spirit. Their definition of sin is not your definition of sin. Their idea of new birth is not your idea of new birth, but they'll call it new birth. <laughs> they'll call it Holy Spirit. They'll call it the true light that illuminates. They'll call it the same stuff. It sounds the same. Pi. It doesn't matter if you say it sounds the same. 3.14 does not equal coconut custard. It never has and it never shall. The problem is not in the mathematics. The problem is in the semantics. And so it is with grace. In English, grace is undeserved favor. In Hebrew, grace is Chesed, God's mercy in the covenant. In Greek, grace is charism. We get the word charismatic, a gift. So in English, grace is undeserved, unmerited favor. In Greek, it's a gift, not something you earned. In Hebrew, it's God's mercy in and through the covenant. Not something anybody could ever merit. It's the mercy of God towards sinners. That is grace. The New Testament says we are saved by grace. We did not earn our salvation. The reason we are born again and on our way to heaven is because Jesus took our sin on the cross. We didn't earn it. He earned it for us. In Roman Catholicism, it's different. Grace does not mean what it does in Hebrew or in Greek or even in English. It rather means actual or sanctifying. It's an ethereal substance. That is earned. 
It's earned by sacraments. It's earned by novenas, by rosaries, by doing works, even by doing things that are contrary to the Bible, like praying to the dead. <coughs> the Roman Church has a different definition of grace. They will tell you, yes, we are saved by grace. Oh, the Reformation was a mistake. The Protestants say it, the Catholics say it, everybody agrees we're saved by grace. Ask Chuck Colson, shake hands. We're all one now. The Reformation was a misunderstanding. No, it was not a misunderstanding. The Reformers were Roman Catholic priests who read the Bible. They made a lot of mistakes, they got a lot of things wrong, but they knew what Catholicism was. And when they went to the Word of God, they really found out what it was. A false gospel. A paganized religion. An immoral institution. And Protestantism has turned out to be just as bad and in some cases worse. But let's look at it. Grace. We're saved by grace. We can all agree we're saved by grace. The same as we can all agree on pie. But do you mean the pizza, or do you mean three and one-seventh? This is the devil's geometry. You're never going to find out the area of the pizza with the wrong kind of pie. <laughs> You're never going to get to heaven with the wrong kind of grace. You are never, ever, ever going to worship the true Allah without worshiping the true Allah. <laughs> you are never going to know Jesus Christ unless you know the true Jesus Christ. Pie is pie. But what do you mean by pie? It's the words that throw people off. Yeah. Not the values, not the numbers. Not even the definitions. It's just the way the words are used. Yeah. <laughs> and they can be very clever mm -hmm. in the way they use words. Let's understand this further. Can two go down the same road unless they agree? Turn with me, please, to Romans chapter 16, verse 17. This is Alpha. Okay. This is Omega. Alpha and Omega. We're all trying to head up the same direction. Straight up. That's the direction. 180 degrees. To hit the circle. Okay. 
Next to it. Is another one. 180 degrees. That is the trajectory. They will both eventually hit the circle. Eventually. They can begin at different points of the alpha baseline. But as long as they are 180 degrees, they will reach omega. However, in order to reach omega and needing to be 180 degrees, there is a way they have to make sure they are 180 degrees. That is called, in geometry, a right angle. A right angle is always 90 degrees. There is 90 degrees in a right triangle. Is there? As long as you are 90 degrees, you can be sure you're heading in a 180 degree direction. But how can you be sure that there's 90 degrees? Simple. You cut that in half. And you make that 45 degrees. So if you have a 45 degree angle at the base, you know you have a 90 degree angle at the base, providing the 45 degree angle bisects where the two lines come together at the angle. As long as the angle is bisected, at 45 degrees, you know you got a 90 degree angle. And if you got a 90 degree angle, you know you have a 180 degree angle. The little angles make sure the big one mm -hmm. is correct. And the big one is what counts. But if the little one goes off just a little bit, you're going to have a problem. Only the problem may not be easily apparent. This line can look just like the other lines. Only It's not 90 degrees. It's 89 degrees. For all intent and purposes, this line will seem parallel to the 180 degree lines. But it's not 180 degrees. It is off slightly. And as a result of being off slightly, its trajectory will change. It will never reach omega. All you need to do is make one slight change in the degree of the base angle. A slight little change. You got a problem. You're going off. Oh, they look parallel. 
We shouldn't argue about it. It's going in the same direction. But it isn't going to arrive where it's meant to. All you got to do is make one slight change. It's almost unnoticeable initially. But eventually, you're going to be out in space, way off base. Physicists know this. Astronomers know this. Mathematicians know this. Engineers know this. Why don't preachers? It's the devil's geometry. It looks so good and so right. Now understand something. These lines can begin at different points. Somebody can be a premillennial dispensationalist. If you like theological terms, that's the closest to what I am. That's the closest to what I am. Yeah, it's the closest. I don't buy the whole bill of goods, but that's basically what I think the Bible teaches. Now, of course, these terms like dispensationalism are things that the church invented to try to explain systematic theology. I don't really make major issue of them, but it's just a way to explain something. Like the word Trinity, it just as a way to explain something that's in the Bible, even though the word Trinity is not in the Bible, it explains the truth. Okay. The word millennium is not in the Bible, but it, 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 it's just a word that the church invented to explain the truth. Well, dispensational is the same. That's my view. I believe that. I also am a moderate charismatic cum Pentecostal. I don't believe the gifts of the Spirit ended with the Apostles. Amen. I don't like the extremist and the experiential theology. I don't believe most of what you see today with the Elam and the charismania is, is, is God. I don't believe that's charismata. But I do believe what's in the Bible. I don't believe in cessationism, the view that these things... I don't believe that. But there are people who see that different than I do. I know some good Christians who at least in theory, are pretty well convinced these gifts don't exist. Part of the problem, of course, is they've only seen the counterfeit. <laughs> they haven't seen the real. That's part of the reason. But they might be somewhere different on the baseline than I am. But they're still looking at the same map. They're still heading in the same direction. Nobody says that people who don't operate in the gifts of the Spirit won't be saved. Paul does not say that in 1 Corinthians. On the contrary, he says that there are people who do not operate in the gifts who are saved. Do I agree with their position? No. Do I think they're misguided? Yes. But does that mean I think they're not going to heaven? Of course it doesn't. You know them by their fruits, not by their gifts. And in many cases, the gifts you see today are not even real. You can begin on a different point. As long as you're heading the same direction. And you don't go off at the base point. What? constitutes alpha. What are the base issues? I have always said repeatedly it is the supreme doctrinal authority of scripture correctly 
exegeted. The only basis for Christian doctrine is the Word of God. And the only basis to interpret the Word of God correctly is with exegesis. What is exegesis? Taking out of the Word of God what is in there in the original languages. But then there's something called asegesis. What these people do They're not taking out of the Word of God something in, in there. They are reading into it something that is not. Like replacement theology. <laughs> like post-millennialism. The real problem with people who are post-millennialists or who are replacementist. It's not that the belief itself is false. It's the way they arrive at it. They have to read things into the Bible the Bible does not say. The New Testament never says the church is Israel. The New Testament never says God's finished with the Jews. But the issue is not replacement theology. The issue is scripture. How do they get this? Covenant theology. The issue with Calvinism is not just Cal it's how they get it. Does the Bible ever say that God only ever made two covenants? One with Adam and one with Abraham? Now, Jesus said, this is the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. <laughs> They're negating what the Bible says, and what Jesus said, with something of their own invention. The issue is not simply their wrong belief, but how they arrived at it. That's Kingdom Now Theology, Dominion Theology. Second, Doctrine of God. I don't care if you use the term Trinity or not. Personally, I don't use it. I prefer the term Triunity. But if you don't want to use the term triunity, you prefer trinity, that's fine. If you don't use any of those terms, that's fine. But the Bible says that there is one God in three eternally existing persons. One God in three eternally existing persons. I don't care if you say trinity and I don't care if you don't. I don't care if you say triunity, and I don't care if you don't. I don't care if you explain it in terms of the Athanasian Creed, and I don't care if you don't. What I do care is you understand the doctrine of God, that Jesus is fully human and fully divine. If somebody has a wrong doctrine of God, oneness, that they fudge the issue, of the triunity of the Godhead, like Tommy Tenney or T.D. Jakes. Or if they believe Mary co-redeemed us when the Bible says God is our Savior. Now you got a problem. Now you've changed the angle. You know, my family are Jewish. We worship on Saturday and we worship on Sunday. If you want to worship on a Wednesday, I don't care. That's not going to change the angle. Our Sabbath is in Jesus. It's not in a day. My family, for cultural and testimonial reasons, we eat kosher. It doesn't matter to me if you like shrimp. Bon appetit. 
eating shrimp is not going to put anybody in hell, and not eating it isn't going to put anybody in heaven. Only Jesus is going to put people in heaven. That's not going to change the angle. I'm a convinced pre-millennialist. I know people who with responsible exegesis, although I disagree with it, argue for a millennialism, like Martin Lloyd-Jones. Now, he was wrong on that point. I'm convinced. I know he was wrong. But that didn't make him a heretic. It's post-millennialism that's heretical. Because post-millennialism says the church is going to conquer the world before Christ comes and we're going to take dominion. The Bible says the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent, not the woman. The Lord of glory will trample Satan under your feet. What they do is they deify the church. You understand? They deify the church. In effect... They put the church in the place of Christ, making the church an antichrist institution. Third, unrepentant immorality how can any evangelical be part of a denomination? How can any evangelical church be part of a denomination that will ordain homosexuals and lesbians? How can you be aligned with those people? God hates divorce. Now, if somebody was divorced and remarried before they were saved, that's something else. We can look at that on a case-by-case -case basis. If you get saved after you were married and your unbelieving wife or your unbelieving husband leaves you, that's something else. The unbeliever left. If they leave you for another and go into adultery and they won't repent, that's something else. But two saved Christians getting divorced should be unheard of. It should not even be something that crossed our mind. It should be a swear word. It should be something filthy and vulgar. The concept of it should be just something so outlandish and removed from the way we think that it's not something we'd ever take into consideration. The permanency of a Christian marriage is to testify to the eternal unity of the Godhead itself, himself. Achad. Adam and Eve were to become Achad, one flesh. And so here, Israel, the Lord our God is Achad. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Achad, oneness. This oneness. The permanency of the marriage and of the family is to testify to the eternal oneness of God in his own nature and his kingdom. It reflects himself. He hates anything. Would you want an ugly picture of you? Would you want somebody... So, <laughs> suppose you had a, a lovely wedding picture of you as a bride or as a bride and groom. And, and a pair of imposters came in, dressed up like Dracula, and the bride of Frankenstein came in <laughs> and took that picture and hung it up on the wall and they said it was you and your husband or you and your wife. What would you think? I don't want that ugly picture. That doesn't reflect what we were like on our wedding day. We were good looking then. <laughs> that's, that's Dracula. That's the Bride of Frankenstein. That's not my wife. Well, a Christian marriage is to be a picture of something spiritual and eternal. God hates divorce. He hates it. How can you let people who get divorced without biblical grounds come and be members of a church and take the Lord's Supper? How can you let them stand in a pulpit? But they're doing it. It's unrepentant immorality. The base angle has gone off. There's a fourth one. the gospel. How is sin atoned for? 
How are fallen men and women with a corrupt human nature justified? All have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. We are all sinners, we are all bound for hell until Jesus intervenes. How can people like us be saved, given the fact that in and of ourselves we are of no real good in the sense that God considers good, which is perfection? Be ye holy as I am holy. How can we be as holy as God? We cannot be. Be ye perfect as I am perfect. How can we have the perfection of God? We can't. It must be imputed to us. When Jesus went to the cross in our place, he took our sin to give us his righteousness. The only way we can be holy as he is holy is because it's his holiness. Amen. The only way we can be perfect as he's perfect is because it's his perfection. It's all grace. He justifies us. Amen. Our works are something we do because we've been saved, not in order to get saved. So how... Are we saved? What is the gospel? Is it a social gospel of good works? Is it sacraments, rituals, that have an ex opere operato innate capacity to save us? You think sprinkling water on a baby is going to make it a Christian? What's the gospel? Is it the Mormon celestial law? No, there's only one gospel. He who knew no sin became sin. He's the propitiation for our sins, the expiation for our sin. God became a man and was nailed to the cross in my place and rose from the dead to give me eternal life. That if I repent of my sin and put my faith in him, he will save me. That's the gospel. They got another gospel. They're not Christian. The baseline is off. All the outward trappings may be the same. But if one of those issues is off, if one of those issues is slightly off, you've changed the degree of the base angle. And they're not going to reach Omega. Two cannot walk down the same road unless they agree. In conclusion, let us look at Romans chapter 16, verse 17, please. I urge you, brethren, keep an eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you've learned and turn away from them. Such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and splattering, flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. The people who change the base angle are religious con artists. They know how to talk. They know how to manipulate the words. They know what to say and how to say it. They know how to seem something different than they are. As Paul describes them in 2 Corinthians, they're like Lucifer. He comes as an angel of light. His servants are the same way. But they've changed the base angle. They cause dissensions. Now look what happens. Suppose only one of these kept it as 90 degrees. The others were off. 89, 89, 89. They changed. They began right, but then they changed their angle along the way. Which one is the one that is divisive? The one that broke away or the one who stayed on the same path? Two roads. 
a road to heaven? Hell. Two roads. The road to heaven is the straight one. The road to hell branches off from it. And you got two people. So they reach a crossroads. One decides he's going to stay on the road he's always been on. They both walk the same road, but one is going to continue. The other is going to turn away. He's going to take another road. When the road divides, which one is divisive? The one who stays on the road or the one who gets off the road and takes another? But in the last days, you have the apostasy. You have the great apostasy. While it's only a handful of people will stay on the road of the apostles' teaching, the majority of people Take another road. And this majority who've taken another road say, because we are more in number, we're the mainstream. You people who don't want to come with us, you're divisive. <laughs> it's what Isaiah says, woe to those who call good evil and evil good. The biggest youth minister in this country, Stephen Chalk, yeah. says Hindus can have salvation without faith in Jesus. Muslims can have salvation without faith in Jesus. Jesus said, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sin. Jesus said, unless you were born again, you will not enter the kingdom of God. No, says Stephen Chalk. So what does the Evangelical Alliance do? Throw him out? No, that's Stephen Chalk. I have nothing to do with Stephen Chalk. He's a heretic. You're divisive. I didn't divide. I still believe the gospel. He's rejected it. He says he doesn't believe. He used to say that God was pouring out his wrath on Jesus for his sin. He doesn't say he preaches that anymore. Now he realizes what's good and true in Hinduism and, Muslim, and, and in Islam, that's the grace of God saving them the way Jesus saved him. This is the apostasy of the last days. Only those who won't go along with this, those who speak out against it, they're called divisive. No, no. God says it's Steve Chalk and his friends who are divisive. I still believe what I've always believed. I still believe what Charles Spurgeon believed. The Baptist Union doesn't. They're ecumenical. I still believe what the founders of Elam believed, apart from the British Israelism nonsense. It's Elam that's divisive. They've left their own heritage. I still believe what the founders of the Assemblies of God believed. It's Weaver and the Assemblies of God that are divisive. I still believe the original. I believe the original because the original was biblical. There may have been certain differences in terms of where they began on the baseline.
but they were all heading the same direction. You change the angle slightly and you wind up in the wrong place. There must be heresies, heresies, 1 Corinthians 11, 19, among you to prove which is true. There's plenty of heresy today. Yeah. Yeah. It will prove which is true. Right. A slight change in the base angle. Pi or pi. Mm. God's lines are always straight. Amen. The devil's lines are always crooked. Mm. We have the devil's geometry. Mm. Let's have a break. <laughs>